If I've done my math correctly, at the time of recording this, we are halfway through Season 4. And seeing as how we haven't experienced anything completely offensive yet, I'd say now's a good time to take a look back at the first half of Season 4. So what do I think of it so far? Well, if it continues on the pace that it's currently going, it'll unseat Season 2 as my favorite season so far. Let me put it like this. Through 13 episodes, two Season 4 episodes are residing in my top 10 best episodes of the series, with Flight to the Finish at number 6 and Pinkie Pride at number 8 and Climbing. Meanwhile, there hasn't been an episode from this season that has cracked my top 10 worst episodes of the series. Sure, there have been episodes that weren't that good, but there hasn't been an absolute disaster yet in my opinion. Let's start with something Digi said in his Bats review. The show has definitely undergone a noticeable change in tone from earlier seasons. More episodes at night, more episodes involving supernatural forces, and more episodes with mature topics. However, I believe that this change was not only for the better, but it was almost necessary. What would you say the original target demographic of the show was at the start of the series, not taking the bronies into account? 6 to 10? Well, that was more than three years ago, and those 6 to 10 year olds are now 9 to 13, almost completely out of the original age range. I remember reading a really good post relating to this on the MLP Analysis Reddit board, which I'll link in the description. But basically, the show is maturing alongside the original target demographic. The creators of the show know what they're doing. They know kids' brains develop quicker than those of adults, so they're changing the subject matter of the show to accommodate the new tastes of the original fans. Think about your interests when you were that age. Was that around the age when you got into superheroes? Maybe that explains the existence of power ponies? How about Indiana Jones? Was this the range when he became the coolest thing ever? How about horror stories where people turned into monsters and creatures and stuff? Maybe sports. 9 to 13 is a common age for kids to start getting invested in sports, and one of the major storylines of the season is the pony version of the Olympics. Hell, the upper end of that range is around the age when you start becoming attracted to other people. Besides, they already know that we'll stick with the show no matter what the subject matter, just as long as the quality of that subject matter stays at a high level. As long as the show makes great stories like Flight to the Finish and Pinkie Pride and occasionally throw in Derpy, we'll be fine. Speaking of Derpy, I am glad that she made her triumphant return in Rainbow Falls, but despite what Tommy said, I do think the animators are putting her in certain scenes just to make the bronies happy and go, "Oh, look at how adorable Derpy is. I mean, Trender Hoof pointed at her and called her unappreciated. Think that was coincidental? Am I complaining about this? Absolutely not, but I am calling it fan service. And while we're talking about memorable characters, there were quite a few new characters this season. The greatest of which is obviously Cheese Sandwich, as every line that comes out of his mouth was freaking gold, which is relieving. Bringing in a legit celebrity can be problematic, since as Mr. Enter noted, the problems with the celebrity appearance are numerous. The celebrity could either show up just so the episode would have a celebrity, or the celebrity could show up and contribute nothing that any other voice actor couldn't do. Thankfully, Weird Al did neither. It felt like the role of Cheese Sandwich was specifically designed for him, and Cheese wouldn't have been nearly as memorable without Weird Al's patented brand of insanity. Aside from Cheese, Surrey Polomare was the next best character in my opinion. This show has a great track record with rival characters, with Sunset Shimmer and Lightning Dust serving as great foils for Twilight and Rainbow respectively. And Surrey does not disappoint. I'd be willing to bet that Surrey was once similar to Rarity when Surrey first arrived in Manhattan since the two were once friends. She probably had stars in her eyes and was ready to take Manhattan by storm, the right way until someone royally screwed her over, and from then on she adopted the every pony for themselves mentality. As a result, I kinda wanna see her backstory, at least in the same regard that I'd like to see Lightning Dust's backstory. Then there's Coco Pamel, who most of the fandom fell in love with, but I thought she was just kinda bland. She almost seemed a bit Mary Sue-ish, but then again she didn't have too much screen time, so I'll give it a pass here. The Maniac was a great character for me. She felt like a callback to old school comic book villains, chewing the scenery like a champ, and impressively, she seemed to actually have a brain, which is more than can be said for some of the other villains from this show. Goldie Delicious was kind of a fun character, especially since she basically seemed like what Pinkie Pie will probably be like when she gets older. Unfortunately, some characters weren't quite as fun. Dr. Caballeron was absolutely forgettable and contributed next to nothing to Daring Don't. Bulk Biceps got nerfed severely since his last appearance in Wonderbolt Academy. I mean, he was at least capable enough to get an invite to the Wonderbolt Academy. Why is it that now he has to struggle to the point of nearly passing out just to stay airborne? And Trenderhoof was at best an oblivious non-character, at slightly worse an absolute tool, and at worst an elitist douchebag. 
Then there's the writers. And when bringing up the writers of Season 4, I have to mention Meriwether Williams' rise out of the bottom tier of MLP writers. I haven't exactly made my opinion of Meriwether's episodes a secret, but for those that don't know, I believe she has written four of the five worst episodes of the series. But she's also written a top five episode in Wonderbolt Academy. So far, she's only written one episode. Bats, which I thought was pretty darn good, and believe me, that is a massive improvement for her. But as one writer rises, another falls, and I have to admit, Megan McCarthy has not been impressing me lately, which is not good considering she's the lead writer. So far in Season 4, she's partially written both Three's a Crowd and Power Ponies, two episodes widely regarded as some of the bigger duds of the season. And going back further, she wrote The Crystal Empire, considered by many including myself to be the worst season opener, A Canterlot Wedding, which is either amazing or absolute nonsense depending on who you ask, and Hearts and Hooves Day, which had the romance plot that was just done better in simple ways, and simple ways isn't exactly an all-timer. And then there's Equestria Girls. <sighs> Suffice it to say, she's not exactly endearing herself to me. There's also been a plethora of new writers this season, and surprisingly enough, my Rookie Writer of the Half Season Award goes to Natasha Levenger, and nobody is more surprised about this than me, I assure you. Seriously, if you look at her IMDb page, the only thing it lists, besides MLP, is a 2004 made-for-TV movie called My Sexiest Mistake. Granted, she's largely worked as a playwright since then, and IMDb doesn't mention those, but I didn't know that going into the season. So far, she's written only one episode, Pinky Apple Pie, which was a great episode, so she's one for one. She does have at least one more episode planned for this season, so we'll see if she can keep the streak going. Another surprise this season was Jason Theazin stepping up to the writer's table. Normally, he serves as the supervising director for the show, but for Pinky Pride, he ended up writing the story. Pinky Pride had a great story to it, so props to him. The only thing keeping him from the Rookie Writer of the Half Season Award is that he only got partial credit for that episode, as Amy Keating Rogers wrote the actual thing. On a slightly less optimistic note, we have Ed Valentine. This is a strange case. He wrote my favorite episode of the season, Flight to the Finish. He also wrote Three's a Crowd, which was kind of a dullard. But he does have at least one major problem in that his stories take forever to get started. The actual conflicts of those episodes take more than 10 minutes to get started, which he needs to get a handle on, and soon. Then there's Josh Haber, who's had two episodes that, if you only read the synopses, you'd think they'd be terrible, but both times he's come through and has at least made something entertaining. More so in the case of Castlemania, but still. Lastly, we have Betsy McGowan. So far, all she's written was Power Ponies, which wasn't that good, but she was part of a three-person collaboration, so it's a little difficult to determine what she contributed to the episode, so I'm willing to give her a pass. There is still one more writer who hasn't gotten an episode of his own announced yet through the 16 episodes that have confirmed their writers, Scott Sonenborn. But considering his past work includes Celebrity Deathmatch, consider me sold on him. There has been kind of a big issue with this season that most people can agree is a problem, and that is the flanderization of Pinkie Pie. In nearly every episode this season, she's been portrayed as someone who is immature, childish, and quite simply not the Pinkie Pie we know and love. Now, I will say that this isn't something that's exclusive to Season 4, but it does seem to be happening more often this season. I personally think it's happening because the entire main six, including Pinkie, has appeared in nearly every episode, and you can't exactly have a character as wacky as Pinkie Pie do absolutely nothing in an episode. And when Pinkie isn't the focus of the episodes, she usually gets relegated to simple gags. Now, some have suggested that the rest of the main six shouldn't be in every episode, and to a certain degree, I agree. If a character has nothing to contribute, then they probably shouldn't be in the episode. But the theme for this season seems to be unity. In Princess Twilight Sparkle, Twilight stated that despite her new responsibilities, their friendships may be tested, but they will never be broken. And indeed, their friendships have been tested, whether by internal or external forces, but through it all, they have stayed unified. At least nearly all of the time. And to add to the unity theme, take a look back at Pinkie Pride and Rarity Takes Manhattan, and try to find something I like to call the Main Six Rainbow. There are lots of objects grouped together that are purple, light blue, white, pink, orange, and yellow, which are all of the coat colors of the Main Six. I think this might end up becoming a thing, just keep an eye out for it. I stated in the first part of this rambling mess that vaguely resembles a video at this point that Season 4 is on pace to be my favorite season, because it seems to have combined the best elements of the prior three seasons. Season 1 played it relatively safe, since the people in charge wanted to make sure that they actually got renewed for more seasons. As a result, nearly all of the episodes of that season were at least good, although it meant there were very few absolute gems or absolute turds. They started taking more risks in Season 2, and as a result, it produced some truly amazing episodes. 
but it also produced some absolute garbage that shouldn't even be mentioned in the same breath as the good ones. In season 3, they started making some serious fan service nods. Sometimes they resulted in great episodes, and sometimes the fan service overwhelmed the episode and made it an absolute mess. Season 4 is combining all of those things in a great way. There have been relatively safe episodes, and they were great. There have been complex episodes, and they were great. There have been fandom nods, and not only were they great, they were used in proper amounts. I don't think that there's been any severe fan pandering in this season. Again, I'm not saying this season is absolutely faultless. Episodes like Daring Don't, Power Ponies, Three's a Crowd, and Simple Ways weren't that great. But honestly, they feel like minor inconveniences rather than the massive screw-ups that I think Putting Your Hoof Down and Dragon Quest were. So if this season keeps going like this, I'll be a fan of this show for a long time to come. See y'all later.